everybody, I'm Dr. Boz. Welcome back. These are some of the advanced lessons that I give to patients in a ketogenic state. They have volunteered to be present and online to share some of their education with you as we walk through some of the more difficult questions that happen on a ketogenic diet. I'm Dr. Boz and I'm all about improving health one ketone at a time. I want to take a minute to say thank you to Jennifer and John for continuing to be brave and vulnerable as they talk about their medical problems and we discuss them on this YouTube channel. This week we get even more intimate with some of the questions about hormones and females. The hormones specifically we cover in this are vitamin D, some cortisol, but also some reproductive hormones for females. We take on the sensitive topic of hot flashes, menopause, and why it's so important for your brain to not spend years in hot flash zone. Women, this is really important. Take a listen to this, encourage Jennifer as she suffers through some hot flashes and some not so fun news when it comes to what's going on with her hormones. If you like these in-depth conversations, you can check out more on my website, bozmd.com. That's B-O-Z-M-D.com. Sign up for my newsletter or for the free ebook if you're learning how do you get started on this ketogenic journey. Please continue to show support for Jennifer Marie on her website, Keto Friendly Recipes. Thanks for tuning into my channel. I'm here to help you with your health one ketone at a time. Hi, keto friends. How are you doing this fine Sunday evening? We are back with Dr. Annette Bosworth and myself, Jennifer, Jennifer Marie. We are doing our normal keto talk and we have a very interesting conversation this weekend. We are talking hormones. This seems to be a very big topic within lots of keto groups, especially the low carb inspirations group, where there's just a lot of hormone talk and a lot of issues and a lot of problems. And we're going to dive deep. We're going to dive real deep into this. Aren't we, Dr. Boz? How are you? Absolutely. No, I'm doing great. I just want to say thank you for having hot flashes so that we can have this uh, teachable moment. <laughs> so glad it's you and not me. I am not no, having no. fun. I mean, can you tell? I'm even, I'm even like hot right now. Um, it's, it's not been good. Let's, let's remind people um, exactly where we are, just in case there's new people that have come on. Um, my name is Jennifer. I run the Keto Friendly Recipes page. We do a lot of uh, recipes, but we also do a lot of talking about keto and helping people on their journey. Um, we just wanna give you as much information. And I have invited Dr. Annette Bosworth. She um, really knows a lot about keto and the science behind it. So it's nice when you're having a problem to bring on an expert who can actually give the science behind it to, to know what you're dealing with. And this time we're talking about hormones, we're talking about hot flashes, we're talking about vitamin D levels. Um, I know that there's been some talk about hair loss, there's been some talk about um, just many different things. Uh, let's dive right in, shall we? Right. Well, thank you again for having me on your channel, Jennifer. I really find this the kind of relationships that I enjoy the most, which are ones where you get to know the patient over time and you can't believe how valuable the understanding of one another becomes when the patient has a problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we've we sat still over the past week and looked at some of the feedback we've had from your people and overwhelmingly positive about how nice it is to hear from an expert and how enriched they find these conversations. Um, we did have a few people say, I don't understand what's going on. So again, we're reviewing where you and I have been um, for the better part of, uh, you know, this started back in November, right? So I thought we'd start tonight just by saying, let me recap where you've been and some of the strategies we've used to help you. Um, I'm an internal medicine physician, and when you reached out to say, you know, Dr. Bosworth, I've been keto for 18 months, and I'd like help getting off of this plateau. And it happened to land on a week where there were so many people from across the country asking me that question that I said, if you want this consult, let's do it live, because I have <laughs> so many people asking this same question. And honestly, it, it is a, it's a privilege to have the kind of followers that you have and the amazing people that wanted to learn how to cook keto. 
And in the same respects, I can't thank the people enough who, you know, follow these stories and really have given me words of encouragement for saying, you know, be brave enough to push record. Uh, and in many ways, satisfying a large crowd is this, it's really difficult to know exactly where am I throwing the dart? Am I hitting the target for satisfying the education? So specifically in our relationship, this works out because I'm satisfying you. You're the patient <laughs> and you're the one who's in, who's got the questions. Yes, the but importantly, there's a lot of people with these same issues. So I tend to ask you questions that I know are either live in the group or friends are struggling or the talk is is a big deal. So I know that you're you, you help with those as well, which we're very grateful for. Right. Education is what we're trying to do here. And unfortunately, there's not 50 years of a ketogenic uh, science uh, to the level where primary care physicians have these answers. So now there's a rapid uptick in the learning, and I'm confident we'll get all the physicians uh, educated over the next few years. But having a voice that can educate through some of the struggles you and John and whoever come else comes on is, is a powerful moment to say, let me show you a story. So I thought for those patients out there, for those folks out there watching that said, what's going on? Um, I thought I'd give a just really quick three or four minute recap of where we've been since November. So November happened. Uh, we said, okay, let's start this. And the first thing I did was say, yep, you've been keto for 18 months um, and you are stalled and you can cook way better than I can. <laughs> you know the rules of keto. You've got it down. But uh, let's see what your body's doing. And so we had you cross this threshold of poking your finger and checking your glucose and checking your ketones. And what that did was it took my science lab from this place here in my clinic into your biomechanics, your biometabolism right inside your body. And you also um, said, yep, I'm really gonna hunker down and I, I really wanna get these last few pounds off. Um, so your numbers in those first few weeks, I said, I want you to check your glucose. At the same time, you check your ketones. And then I use a, a ratio taking the glucose divided by the ketones to tell how well uh, is she doing regarding her insulin level. And those first few weeks, you did amazing, much better than I expected uh, that you were able to, your glucose was not above 100. I think it was 70s or 80s. Many times you checked. And in fact, your ketones were probably higher than I was expecting them to be too. Mm -hmm. You were in the 1.5 to maybe even over 2 point, probably 2.2 or something. Mm -hmm. But in that pretty generous ketone range, not 0.4 or 0.6 or 0.7, I was expecting that. Um, and the reason I was expecting that is when people are in a, in a lull for weight loss, their insulin is usually higher than they think it is. So for whatever reason, you came back with an A-plus report for those first few weeks and by golly, you lost weight. Um, I think the other thing that we really uh, enforced in your case was we were trying to make sure that your overall insulin production was lower. Um, so we said, all right, Jennifer, we want you to have a 12 hour time where there's nothing but salt or water that goes past your lips. Yep. And, and you remember that phase where like, okay, this is step one. And when I look at, for the most part, part, those keto consults, I, I host a keto group every week in my community. And when people come in and they have stories, I say, show up with stories plus these numbers next week. And that helps me look, look, dot, look deep into your chemistry. But you really did well. You were able to say absolutely no calories during that 12 hour break. And a couple of times, I think it was th week three or four, we said, well, let's just make sure that the timer for the 12 hour eating window starts in the morning when you wake up. And so it became this time-restricted eating, which you can also call intermittent fasting, whichever word people like to use. Um, but we really paid special attention that your circadian rhythm, that rhythm that wakes up your brain in the morning where the body produces its own prednisone, its own cortisol, and sugar comes out of storage, and that energy floating around your body really does wake you up. That is the beginning of your metabolism with this time-restricted eating. So we, you get up at like 5.15, you've got coffee in by like 5.30. So I said, all right, that's the beginning of your timer. You can't, we don't want you having anything in your stomach from 5.30 on at night. That's, that's your time restriction. And by golly, you did great. We yeah. spent the next few weeks talking about John and some of the struggles he was doing. 
you were just kind of coast along losing one to two pounds a week and really a few little issues, but nothing that was exciting. Really, you were just the main. So, and you went from that to like, I, I kept saying, oh, if I only had patients like Jennifer, where, you know, you were talking about cheating with things like a scoop, of, or a couple bites of garbanzo peas. beans or something. Yeah, pea, yeah. 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 No. Peas and beans. Like, like I don't oh, cheat with please. like, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I need, it. that's amazing. So great report, right? Yes. And then what, what was the, uh, what sabotaged you? I remember, I think it was a couple days before Christmas. You said, I almost canceled the show. Why did you almost cancel the show? Yeah, I got really, really sick. I was doing some traveling. My immune system was really, really down. I'd been working really hard. And then um, as I was traveling, not feeling well, I got back to Texas and the cedar had hit and I'm really reactive to cedar. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, one of our lives, I had fever. I know I had fever. Um, I just wasn't feeling well. And I didn't go to the doctor right away. Um, I, I waited some because I hadn't been to the doctor in a while. Right. Um, it was a couple of days and then I had to get antibiotics because I had a sinus infection. So, right. And you really you had sweats and you were tired and it was just, yeah. you were slumpish. And you said, geez, doc, what's up with my numbers? They're not very good anymore. And I kind of pushed back and said, just be nice to yourself. Having an infection is a setback, but it, the, if it lasts for six weeks, it's really a setback. So the fastest way to get over it is take rest, take hydration, and be nice to yourself. Slow down and heal. And you did a good job. You did that too and said, okay, I'll just take it easy. <clears throat> From there, we went um, on you know, focusing on several of John's things. And then uh, in the last... Like last week, you were still having trouble. So now we're like, you know, almost a week and a half since the antibiotics. And and then um, we did a, a Skype together. And I think you took your jacket off uh, like in an hour of our conversation that wasn't broadcasted. You <laughs> took your jacket on and off like six times. I did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> At which point I was a very observant doctor and said, maybe we should check some labs. <laughs> Yes. I was dripping in sweat. I was, I promised you I was probably going to spontaneous combust if there was such a thing, even though we're 90% water, I was yeah, sure yeah. that was going to happen. Like what the heck, right? Absolutely. And as much as it's not funny, it was like, oh my goodness, I don't think she got the one sleeve off before she's putting the other sleeve back. <laughs> like so bad like I think we should check some numbers yeah so uh before we get to that punchline though um there were some other numbers where I said well if you've had labs checked uh let me check a couple of other things that I'd like to know about um and again these are great keto teachable moments so let's start with your vitamin d so here's the vitamin d level right so if you look at that you go back to March of 2016 and again, vitamin D is a fat chemical, a fat, it's really more of an enzyme than a vitamin. It's, it's, if they were going to rename vitamins, I don't think vitamin D would make it into the vitamin category. It's really an enzyme um, that floats around the blood and it comes from cholesterol. Uh, so it is very much based in fat. So um, tell me about what your life was in March of 2016 regarding keto, not keto, brand new keto. Your, your number was 14 and that's yeah. pretty low. So I was one of those carb addicted, sugar addicted people walking around as most people are today. Uh, yeah. Overweight. Um, that was 60 pounds heavier than what I am today. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. That was, that was life. Then I was struggling with, um, low vitamin D. I remember seeing an endocrinologist taking, um, they prescribed fill, pills at, uh, 50,000 IU, whatever. IU international units. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I remember having to take a hundred thousand at one time a week just <laughs> to get up, you know? Yeah. Right. So again, when you're filled with sugars and carbs are your default. And then there is one more complication in your, in your case, which is you've had a gastric surgery. So mm -hmm. the section where the, the fatty um, vitamin would be absorbed, um, that is really right next to where the gallbladder squirts out the bile and it's really related to high fat. And if you're a low fat kind of gal, uh, meaning high carb, you know, that's, that, that is how that equates. Uh, you're probably not getting very much vitamin D, even though you live in Texas and not in South Dakota, where there's vitamin D is from the sunshine. 
So um, let go back to that lab one more time and let's just look at what your labs were this week. So this week, when we were checking labs, I said, let's grab your vitamin D and see what it is. 38 is not, I think on the lab part, it'll say above normal, but I really like my patients to have a, a vitamin D of, I know their brains are healthy if they've got a 50 or greater. Uh, and I just want you to recognize and celebrate, you know, without um, being super compliant on the vitamin D <laughs> regimen, because you might be human. Um, I mean, vitamin D is prescribed for a lot of things, but it is uh, a fat-based chemical. Um, can you show the slide where it talks about vitamin D2, um, uh, cholesterol to vitamin D, that one where I think sunlight is involved? There you go. So this is a great little slide that just shows you when you go to chemistry class and you draw out cholesterol and you draw out vitamin D, I mean, you can practically lay those two little fellows over each other. They're almost identical. And vitamin D comes from a cholesterol. It is a product of cholesterol. And it is the energy that happens in our skin that flips it from cholesterol to vitamin D. Uh, you can see in those two little yellow spots that if we want to replace that, we can give you something, we can give you a, a vitamin D2 or D, D3. And those are some of the prescriptions that you've gotten from your physicians before, where they're just saying, okay, skip the cholesterol. Let's just give her the good stuff. Don't make the sun do anything. She's really depleted. And, and we know that the enzymes that this cholesterol takes care of, uh, it is it, it is thousands of interactions that vitamin D will help um, make possible over a, a period of time. Um, now there should be one in there that says cholesterol turns into a whole bunch of different things and you'll see some arrows going from different slides. Is this it? Cholesterol yeah, well, and vitamin D? That's a, that's a great one. We're saying they're absolutely bioidentical. This is another one to say sunlight is the way that transfers from one to the other. And it is. Um, so let's show your cholesterol numbers next. Oh, so like I said, if we go back um, and we look in your labs and we plot out what was Jennifer's cholesterol. Um, now, let's leave that up there as you described to me. Go back to August of 2013. And I want you to notice that your healthy cholesterol, your HDL, was 63. Mm -hmm. um, and that your um, triglycerides, uh, it's covered up on my slide. What does it say on yours? What's the triglycerides? Seven. It's 70. 70. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, your total cholesterol was 185. Yes. Um, and then you fast forward to 2016, and those two columns are essentially uh, both a time where you were high carbohydrate, low fat. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, August of 2018, how long would have you been keto by the time your cholesterol's? Oh, of August, a uh, year and a half. Okay. So looking at a year and a half, that LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol, the one people really worry about, um, it's hardly changed. I mean, from 100 to 108 to 114 or 100 to 114, in my spectrum, I'd say that's nothing. Um, but what's powerful is look at how your good cholesterol has gone from the 50s or 60s, which is still good. We want it above 50. Your healthy cholesterol is now 85. What? Uh, what what do you uh, do you understand why that happens? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> so uh, when when you're eating high fat, um, mm -hmm. you are feeding um, you're you're feeding cholesterol. When patients come in and say, "Doc, you know you're eating all this fat," and for thirty years we've been told that if you eat that fat, um, you can't have uh, you're going to have a heart attack. You're mm -hmm. going to have a heart attack. Um, and what's um, powerful in a high fat diet is when you're ketogenic and you keep the inflammation low, um, not only do your good cholesterol go up, but I would have actually expected your triglycerides to have been better than they were in this lab. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I would contend that this August is about what two months before we met. And that's in that phase where you weren't able to lose weight. So yes. I would bet that uh, I put that little insulin there with the ketones pouring water on it. Mm -hmm. I would have bet that in that August time, you were still making more insulin than you probably knew you were. And I'm guessing that because of how many triglycerides are there. Triglycerides are really uh, sugars or carbs that you've, um, that you've uh, been pulling in over time. 
And I think uh, that there might have been more, uh, not so much carbohydrates, but somehow you were stimulating insulin. Um, and you know what? I would agree with that because I was used to eating uh, against what my hormones were doing. I would not eat for a, a portion of the day. I would get so busy. I would have coffee and then not eat. And it would be four o'clock and then I'd be hungry. And then I would eat in the evening, evening. So, so my body never had a chance to recover from the insulin response from the eating that happens. So it would be little bits, little bits, little bits throughout the day until we really tightened up the eating window, supported the hormones by eating in the daylight hours earlier in the day and then stopped it. So I would, I would think you are right. So, and look at how much you've learned because before, when people are keto, they really focus on how important it is that they are high fat, uh, low carbs, and they stick to it. But it is very powerful what happens in a insulin resistant body, meaning somebody who's had the weight on for a while and mm -hmm. they stay in an elevated state of insulin. What they stimulate insulin production every time they eat, even though it's keto, it's really, um, especially if there's any snacking or if they do any of that um, like trend of, um, like they, they play the fiber game, like, oh, my net fiber is, you know, and, and really what they're doing is they're putting some food in, in bulk in their gut and that gut stimulates the insulin production and the insulin is what stops them from losing weight. You have to lower the insulin in order to lose weight. The insulin must be low. Insulin kills the weight loss process. Definitely. So the next slide I want you to show is the one that says cholesterol. And okay, I, this is like my favorite. So if you look in the center there, um, I say transformation of cholesterol into all these steroid hormones. And you're going to see that one of them is progesterone. And you've had that before in the form of a cream. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's cortisol. And then there's testosterone. And then there's estradiol. And then that other one that's off to the side is the vitamin D, which we've just talked about. But so most of the keto things are really high in fat, and that is where your cholesterol comes from. So when patients say, I've been keto for four weeks, and I went in to get my cholesterol checked, and it's sky high. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, first of all, don't look at your cholesterol until you are truly keto adapted. Uh, keto adaptation is a very powerful part where the ketones um, are coming from fat. And that fat level of uh, of hormones, uh, when, when your body has, uh, not seen them in a while, I think if you, could you describe to the audience something you told me off air, which was when you had your first transition, um, to the ketogenic diet, what you did, you had hot flashes then. So can you describe? I did. That? And I think that's pretty, I would say that's pretty normal. If you talk to many women, once we get started on the keto diet, it's like just a couple of months in, I don't even know. I don't remember the time frame, but I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm hot. And then I'm cold. And then I'm hot. And then I'm cold. And it feels like your body just starts working or these hormones just really start to wake up. And then they do taper off. It mm -hmm. seems right. Or they did for me in the beginning. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like, you know, you're doing something right if you're mixing things up that haven't worked before. <laughs> right. Well, what I tell patients, and there's a chapter in my book about this, is that you're going to have a period uh, because that's one of the biggest calls for patients when they show up and say, Hi, hey, doc, I have hot flashes. Um, and you want to know, are you in menopause? Uh, the first question I think I asked you was, do you have a period? And unfortunately, that wasn't very helpful because you want to explain to the audience why that didn't no, help us very much? Um, I've had the ablation. I'm done with that. I haven't had one in, what, 10 years? No. Nope. <laughs> right. <laughs> so whatever your hormones are doing on in the background, there is no outward signal of a menstrual, menstrual cycle that gives the doctor or you the confidence that says, oh, she's still, in, she's not anywhere near menopause. She has normal periods. Yeah. And so, you know, I had somebody else reach out this past week saying, I wonder if I'm going through menopause. And the first question I asked was, do you have normal periods? And she's like, oh yeah, I'm still like clockwork. And I'm like, the mm -hmm. chances your hot flashes are all from our hormonal are very unlikely if you still have regular periods. So when we were trying to figure out what was going on with your hot flashes, we couldn't use that history. We said, all right, let's, let's send you to the lab and see what else we can find. Yeah. So that's when, can you pull up the labs that show us your, I think there's an estradiol in there and then there's an FSH. If you show, show both of those, um, that will teach us a little bit. 
questions. I think this is it. Yes, there you go. Okay, okay. so if you go back, that was August of 2013. And that, uh, the FSH, just leave that one up so I can use it because I'll come through each of these uh, these um, panels uh, to, to talk about what that is teaching us. So the, the FSH is something called the follicular stimulating hormone, and it comes from your pituitary gland or the brain. This is the brain talking to the ovaries. And if you go back to 2003, for whatever reason, your doctor looked at this and said, hey, um, I wonder if her ovaries are working well. And they checked to see what is the signal coming from the brain to the ovaries. And it was whispering. Your ovaries were saying, you know what? We hear from our little brain every once in a while. We do exactly as we're told. And there's no need to holler. <laughs> Just foreshadowing for what's going on right now. You know what, Dr. Boz? I love how you geek out on the science of this. I just love it. <laughs> well, it's, it's good because it makes sense too. And, and you, yeah. you, you are suffering and you're like, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to help her? Because So if you go to estradiol, that 93, which was taken in 2016, we don't happen to have an FSH at the same time, but that's still another time where we did, you know, your doctor did the labs and showed us, hey, guess what? Throughout her bloodstream, she's doing pretty well. She has that um, estradiol, um, which is coming from her ovaries. She's making a nice, nice level of that. Um, if you go to today, yesterday, when we did your labs, or it is right there. So keep it just right there. Um, it shows us that your FSH is over a hundred. Yes, it's screaming bloody murder. <laughs> yes. Your brain is saying, hey, ovaries, would you wake up? I'm giving you a huge signal to make some estrogen. And they're like, nah, I'm not in the mood. <laughs> they're not giving you, you know, we didn't do an estradiol because the FSH was so high. I don't need to do an estradiol to say, uh, guess what? Your ovaries are not making any estrogen right now. Um, or at least uh, they have not, um, had not made any recently. And this is what comes back to our next decision for you, which is what we have to decide. Um, could we help your ovaries make some estrogen? Or you know, what, what are the options you have for somebody who's in uh, the early stages of menopause, having hot flashes, and trying to lose weight? So let's yeah, go it's it's not a good combo. <laughs> if, if we if we have this goal of six months and trying to get these this fifty pounds off, and we <laughs> run right smack dab into a hormone issue that's very well documented in the labs, okay, we're gonna have to think about this. I've so, got some few choice words that cannot be said on air. <laughs> like oh poor Jennifer <laughs> uh, so the, the interesting part though that I want you to think about is that cholesterol when it got higher and it supplied all of those hormones um, you had talked about when you before you saw me there was another physician uh, that you were getting some supplements from mm -hmm. and if you go back to that cholesterol one one of the supplements you were getting was co cortisol a cortisol manager yeah, cortisol and manager. Then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then another one is at one point you had had some progesterone cream and whether that was improved libido, hot flashes, just, you know, progesterone is again, another one of those fat based hormones. Mm -hmm. And then of course, another one is the estradiol that your ovaries are supposed to make. And the estradiol is um, kind of equivalent to a man's testosterone. So mm -hmm. what testosterone is to a male, est estradiol is to a female. And then there's the vitamin D. And I just want you to carefully look that cholesterol leads to all those things. But I want you to imagine that those are ketones that lead to all those things. So okay. when the ketones are elevated, the supply chain to your ovaries, the supply chain to your brain, the supply chain to your skin for the vitamin D um, are all at their peak performance when lots of fat molecules are available. And a way to measure that is every day in your house, you can measure your ketones. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, an example of biohacking to say, Jennifer, here's some rules, and then we'll show you them. And of course, the plan is always a really perfect, good plan until we meet the human being that's doing it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm pretty good at following orders. I know, but your ovaries aren't listening to me at all. So 
No, they're not. <laughs> so why don't you go and show the chart where it shows the sugars and the ketones you've had for the last month? Oh, okay. That's our very... last week. I think it was the first slide we had up earlier. Yeah, yeah. The very last week. Yeah. All right. So let's let you walk through and tell me. Let's start with that 7:30 in the morning and just tell me what that uh, tell me about those numbers. Yeah, so I'm no longer waking up at five o'clock in the morning. I wake up at about seven, seven thirty here lately. <laughs> so because you're not sleeping as well because of all the hot flashes at night. That's exactly what it is. I am tossing and turning, and I don't wake up like a spring chicken in the morning anymore. It's it's pretty rough. So this is um, I had 78 glucose, only 0.8 on the ketones, which left me at a 98 percent ratio. The next day, okay, so after that, I started fasting for a longer period of time. Yeah, and and that's, that's what our, our assignment was last week. We stretched it from 12 hours to, was it a full 16? We it was a full 16. And I remember that very vividly because it is not easy to do. Um, it's not easy for me to do anyway. It might be easy for others, but I don't like it. <laughs> so, um, we really wanted to push the ketone numbers and to really get them up. So we just pushed for that. Um, I stopped eating at three. Oh, yes. And how did that impact your family? Well, I watched them eat dinner. I served them dinner and I oh. ate salt. So <laughs> You're a better woman than I am. Oh, man. <laughs> it was... Uh, yeah, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as bad. It's a mental thing. I knew that I really... The hot flashes, the sweating, the constant, the interruption of my life every day was worse. So giving up dinner for sick or giving up food for 16 hours didn't seem as bad as what I was dealing with. Mm. So, well, so it, yeah, so keep going, go to the 120. Was that what time? Of, that's another, these are all morning ones. It looks like. Yeah, yeah right? I, I, yeah, I did a morning one. I don't know. I, honestly, I think this was probably the worst night's sleep maybe. Okay. Um, and that, that's all I can maybe give yeah. explanation to that number. Um, now it started to get better because this was, I think in the morning, Oh, actually, let me go back. That 65 and 1.4 number was at night. Oh, that was cool. a PM number. Mm -hmm. You had wanted me to take it in the morning and the P in, the, in the evening. And I was like, huh, I thought the number was more accurate in the morning when you first wake up and making sure you deplete all your glucose. But then shockingly in the evening, my number was the best. So I right. think I have really good numbers in the evening. I think it's just that cortisol or whatever's happening mm -hmm. at night that really does not make the number in the morning very good. Well, and part of that is, is that we hadn't been checking in the evening. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, when I need to give patients something to be confident about, um, mm -hmm. and I'm only having them look in the morning, which is the hardest number to control. That's why I'm so curious about what it is in the morning not only do we get the sweep throughout the sleep time to kind of shut down the body, the metabolism shuts down and then it wakes back up for that cortisol. Mm -hmm. But when you only check in the evening hours, uh, that, uh, they, it looks great. And then you never get to see, did you get to swipe out and have a low insulin level to begin the day with? So if I only get one number, I'm totally going to be aiming for very first thing in the morning. It's the cleanest number for me to understand where their insulin's at. But if they're getting down in their dumps and saying, I just can't make any of my numbers look right, um, then I'm like, no, 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 take it at night. You'll you'll see. Yeah. It's doing really good then. <laughs> We're just not yeah. looking because, you know, the strips cost money and it takes time to do it. And I'm super curious about it. So I like to check it. But that's apparently this rare form of a being. <laughs> yeah, you're the only one who likes to poke your finger and geek out on it. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, we're not, no, 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 don't like to do it. But, you know, to see it, it was nice to see a good number in the evening. It meant that I was doing something right at some part right. of the day, and I was putting the effort. It just wasn't responding, so. Right. Well, I think the other part you should be super proud of yourself is look at your glucoses. They're all in your 70s and 80s. One of them is in your 60s. That, that That's amazing. Yeah. That's so good. You know, and if we were only looking at glucoses, I would be kicking my heels together. Before I started doing this Dr. Boz ratio, I would only look at the glucoses because, you know, ketone meters weren't as easy to find, you know, 
even before we kind of landed on four cares monitor, I would have patients say, gosh, doc, I did five pokes and I still didn't get a recorded number that I could believe in. Yeah. And so spending a lot of money. And so I was really hesitant to push them and say, give me a number. Yeah. Um, now that I've got more confidence in the monitor, I'm not nearly as um, stingy about having them check. But go to the go to the uh, slide where it has the big uh, ratio of, or it's got the blue line across the, the chart. And, and that's really what we're trying to do here. As you look at that, that Dr. Ba's ratio, we're trying to get you over to the lower part in that 40 or you know, 80, 40 or 20 part where it's way to the right of, the, of the, the chart. What we're able to know that is that you can't have good ketones and a low sugar when there's insulin around. So um, the insulin production that your body has been making because of these hot flashes is really throwing that off in the morning. You're also having an extra amount of cortisol in the morning. So again, not your sugars don't go up much because your body is really keeping that controlled. But boy, it's at the price of those ketones. Remember that those ketones are going to turn into vitamin D, cortisol, um, the uh, progesterone, the testosterone for the male, the estradiol for the female, and that vitamin D. You know, those are the hormones that, you know, we talk about improved sex drive and libido for women when these hormones are rich and, and produced. And I have a chapter in my book that I say it does. It does increase your libido. And I would contend it's because it helps your brain so darn much. But in, in, other, uh, in other aspects, it does enrich those, the estradiol and the progesterone levels of hormones within our body as well. So that brings us to what are we going to do with Jennifer and her hot flashes? So um, <laughs> I'm kind of scared. <laughs> well, so the, the key thing that I, uh, I'll give you a couple of options. Um, so let's just tell the audience what we talked about off air, which was, not very encouraging for you. And that was, I could start you on a you know, an estrogen progesterone hormones, and I could put you on hormone replacement therapy and your hot flashes would go away. Uh, it is not an off the table, but uh, do you remember how we were talking about John now takes testosterone shots and the, the doctor is really his testosterone. Those shots are his testosterone. His body doesn't do it anymore. And after that body does it, uh, it doesn't have to do it. The, the doctor is supplying testosterone. There becomes a shift in the body that the body has no need, has no stimulus to make that hormone. And really, especially in a male, it, it can be a life sentence of if we take that testosterone away, he'll get depressed. He will have no sex drive. His uh, concentration, their brain just feels like a mush. I swear to God, it, it's like a, a female brain that's got brain fog and kind of <laughs> Scattered thoughts, and I'm like, see, that's the life of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No but, energy either. If, oh, yeah. he have, if he misses that shot, he can feel it. I think within 24 hours. Yeah, it's a, it's a. Yeah, so his, so what that says is his body doesn't make the testosterone. The doctor does, mm -hmm. and that's great. You live in 2018, and those are options. Or 19 now. Uh, those are options for today's world that do matter. Yeah. However, if we're right at the beginning of a keto or of a choice point for you, do we put you on hormone replacement therapy or do we see if you can produce the ketones to a level that will really kind of spark the production of estradiol? Um, if you were 10 years older, I wouldn't do this, but I would say you probably are at a menopause and this is probably where you're going to be. Um, being uh, in your mid 40s, I would say that's early. It's not uncommon, but it's early. And if we nourish, if we could go back in time and nourish your ovaries for 10 years before this moment, I would contend they wouldn't be here. They would be used to making their own estrogen and they would keep up with the estradiol. They would not be screaming. The brain wouldn't be screaming, make me some estrogen. Um, that we can see over the last, since November, your numbers have done pretty darn good and your ability to make ketones is so good that I would give it a shot to say, let's see if we can push your ketone number to a higher production level and see where this if you, goes. If you say 20, I'm gonna hurt you. <laughs> I don't think I can get into a 20. Well, well that's, and, and that's, that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the difference is, is that you eat a ketogenic meal, you're pretty good at the time-restricted eating, which is the 12-hour thing. And I think that's a safe place for you to stay. Um, I would actually be curious if the uh, if the erythritol gum does produce insulin for you. Have you it ever actually, checked it? Actually, it does. Know. And to be quite honest, um, these lives make me very nervous 
and I'm either eating oh. salt or gum. So they're, they're the one time a week that I do this because I do not like to do lives. I do. Oh. This, <laughs> I honestly do this just to share information that I think is really good with a lot of different people. So if I need some erythrit, if I need some gum to get through it, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> oh, dude, Ryan, I mean, I knew these made you nervous. I had no idea that your coping skill was, was to chew gum, which is common, actually. Chewing on fingernails, chewing on gum, chewing on yeah. you know, salty you know, sunflower seeds. Well, Very it's, either, it's salt or gum. And I don't have salt here with me. I forgot to put it here. Usually it's salt. Um, yeah, I don't like to do the lives. So, but, but curiously, have you ever checked it to see, does that cause you... Um, the 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 key no phone. but you want me to check it right now because i've got the meter right Ooh, here yes, that'd be great by the way this is the meter if um it's the four of six it's the only one let me go ahead and open it let me uh i hate freaking my finger and i'm sweating again like <laughs> poor girl <laughs> Well, so this is the part where there's a choice point in our road. You know, we could put it on hormone therapy. We also could uh, try to do something with your keto metabolic health. Um, and that comes with uh, a couple of changes that I would put in your um, in your weekly pattern. And mm -hmm. one of them is to. So when's the last time uh, you really pushed your ratio to 40 or less? You know, I was 40 or less. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm a little bit shocked because I think I've done, you, you're asking me hard questions when I'm about to prick myself. Okay. okay I'll be quiet. <laughs> like, I still don't like to do this. Yeah. See? <laughs> look how brave you are. Yes. Look how brave you are. Okay. I, I'm telling you, I cringe every time. Okay. Let's do this here. It's counting down. Hold on. Wait, where is, where am I? Yep. What is it? 88. 88. That's, that's, good. Good. that's a little high for me, isn't it? Okay, let me see what my ketones are. Hold on. Oh, I go figure. Look, I'm sweating. No, like, this is <laughs> this is <laughs> real. Her ovaries really are stubborn. They're not. Is, oh my gosh. Here, hold on. I'm doing okay. Here. Uh oh, oh wait. Here. so just because you touched, I saw you touch the, the, the yes, it's see. Hold on. <laughs> you're laughing at me. <laughs> no, you're doing great. <laughs> okay, it's got to hold on. I did it too soon. So this is this is the beauty of this machine though, is that it takes the same um it takes like the purple strip is for ketones. So as soon as that little blood drop yeah, uh, starts beeping, then I should be able to go ahead and grab the grab what I need and hopefully I have enough blood left to do the reading or else I have to poke myself again. But three, two, one, point nine. Point nine. So yes, yeah. obviously so. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's a great teachable moment. I, I don't. I love that you do these lives. And if it takes erythritol gum, just let it be. <laughs> no idea. I'm it sorry. Comes with me. It's, I know. Okay. It's it, it, totally yeah. Like I don't cheat with cake. I don't cheat with breads. I don't cheat. With I use erythritol gum to get me through lives. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the next part will be Hold on. David Corey says, I always get told to prick the side of your finger, not the tip. Doesn't that hurt more? Well, what do the you most, mean? Like, yeah, the, the most nerve endings are right here on the tip of your finger. So if so you, go, I, I do it right here on this. Well, you can't even see right here on the side. Wow. Well, so, so, and I tell the diabetics to do it there too, to, to go over here on the side, uh, like if you were to pinch your finger where my fingers are touching yeah. here, oh, that's okay. right. Okay. And just because there's less nerve endings there. And so it doesn't hurt as much. So when I do my okay. kids, I always poke on the side of their finger. So. Thank you, David. I will do that. <laughs> Yes, so, I know the gum. There's people saying gum makes glucose higher. Yes, ah, I know blah, that. Blah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> definitely know that. No, not a problem. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> like, shh, go away. She's doing great, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about her hormones, poor thing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are a couple things that I would push you to do, and that is to I would fast. I would I would keep your 12 hour ratio like you've done. That's um, not a problem anymore. 
12 and hours. It, and that's the thing that I, I feel like I want to tell people. When I tell people to start fasting, I always say, okay, it, it sounds really scary. And especially if you don't like to do it, like I didn't start two hours before bed, that should give you 10 hours, at least eight hours sleeping, two hours before bed. But the 12 hours really, once you get started, it takes a little bit of an adjustment and then your body almost sinks naturally to where you're, you're, you're out of habits or you're not snacking while you're watching TV and then you're not even hungry. You're not even thinking about it. So 12 is no big deal. It's the right. 16 that is a bit more work. Well, and I also think that when you're trying to reach for 16 every day, and you're the busy mom doing this, you've got a full, you know, life of running your, all of the stuff that you do. Um, you know, that, that it, there are seasons in life. And unfortunately you weren't planning on a perimenopausal season and I'm trying to abort it. Like, okay, let's see if we can push this away. And that comes with, uh, can I get your ketone level higher first thing in the morning? And so, or at least to show that you hit a ratio of 40 or less. So in, in the last week, even when you did the 16 hours, it, it, was it a 40 ratio or was it? I can't remember. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to have to go back and look. Here it is. Not in the morning. Yeah. So it was 46, 46 mm -hmm. but that 46 was in the evening. Right. The best morning was 55. So yeah. Well, so what I would do, I mean, we, we could say 16 hours every day is what you need to be doing. And I'll tell you, you did it a couple of times this week as a test to say, it's hard. Uh, it's hard with the family. It's hard with, you know, when they do 16, when I do 16 and essentially it leaves eight hours of a window to open, people often, you know, say, I can't do it the way you say, doc, I have to put the eight hours in this spot where I eat. And I would contend that if you have a, a hormone shifting going on right now, or if they're my diabetics, I really push them to say, stick with the circadian rhythm as your beginning. It is a more powerful shift of your chemistry if you keep that first part of the timer starts with your morning rise. So having said that, the 12 hours seems to fit in your family, but we're not quite you know, surging enough in your ketone levels, um, in part because you're going through menopause, lucky us. Um, as we try to resurrect the production of these hormones, and again, this is uh, I called a couple, I called one of my very good friends who's an ob gyn she's been in primary care ob gyn for 20 years and said, here's the theory. Do you think that her ovaries could kind of be sputtering and come back as we bathe them in ketones? And of course, she's like, I just want you to know, all the nurses on my, on my ward have read your book and I'm cool because I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I've known her for like 20 years. She's in my, or I've known her for almost 40 years. She's in my wedding. She's a long, good, good friend. But I was talking about saying, you know, what happens if we put you on hormone replacement is that there is a depression that comes with it. There is a slump in your metabolism that comes next when we put people on hormone replacement. Now, there's a slump in your metabolism if you, if you go through menopause. There's a slump in, in depression if you go through menopause. Absolutely. So it's less of a slump when they're on the hormone replacement therapy, if I give you a prescription and put you on this, but it would be best if we can get your body to do this. So I'm pushing you to do this mainly because I'd like to give you the freedom of not being on hormone replacement therapy from the age of mid forties till every, you know, 60 or whatever you stop taking them. Uh, so that means on uh, once a week, I would encourage you to have a time where you fast long enough to get to a ratio of less than 40. Um, okay. Once a week is doable. I think once a week is doable. Um, and it, it means you get to check later on in the day. What happens with those numbers later on in the day is you're burning fuel as you go throughout the day. So like, you'll see me check numbers before I do a workout and then after I do a workout and everybody's always like, why, if you're a fast, you know, I'll be fasted 48 hours and I'm, then I'll do a workout and I'm now I'm fasted 49 hours and I'm post-workout. And they're like, why are your ketones down? Why is your glucose, you know? And I'm like, because my body needed fuel and it used the ketones floating around and they're less. Uh, and I mobilized that the glucose was again, readily available, stored in my muscles that I wasn't going to use it if insulin was high. So I have this low insulin state. I can mobilize my glucose really quickly and I can use ketones and a similar so, thing. Yeah, go ahead. Denise is asking, does the less than 40 have to be in the morning? 
Yeah, that's where the difference is. I would love to see that by having you fast until 40 or less, you are going to see improvements in your morning fasting ketones going forward. Uh, if we get you to 40 with only a 12 hour fast, you're a rock star. You're like the best kitchen <laughs> ever <laughs> because that's hard. I mean, my grandma Rose, when she was going through this and we were trying to get her down to 20, um, she, that's yeah, that's, was, she was four days of fasting. And essentially we ended up using the beta hydrox, the BHB salts, uh, exogenous ketones to get her ratios correct. Um, so having said all that, I don't, think that um, there's lots of other options, but if we can get you to really fast until the ratio says, hey, 36 hours is what we're, you know, or whatever it took you to get there, we're getting under 40. Um, I'll give you some perspective too. In my case, I fast once a week. I start on Sunday and I do what you're, I'm asking you to do. I fast until I get a ratio of 40. So you'll see on my Instagram that it has uh, ratios. And as soon as I get to 40, then I usually stop posting and I will eat at the next meal. So uh, hold on. There was one question about circadian rhythm and I can't find it. Please explain the circadian eating again. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to go ahead and explain that or you want me to? It's up to you. Uh, go for it. I've done a lot of talking. So let's hear it. Let's have you take the airwaves for a while. See what you say. So how you the, it. the way I've understood it and the way Dr. Boz has explained it to me is that there's circa circadian rhythm, our body you should eat when the sun is out. And especially for women, our hormones start pretty early in the morning and you need to feed, you need to eat to support your hormone function. So um, I think you said it starts like 5.30 to six in the morning is when it's pretty high and it mm -hmm. starts to slow down between four and six or in the evening. So the last thing you wanna do is eat while those hormones are slowing down. Very good. Yes, you're you're perfect student, Jennifer. <laughs> Yeah, the circadian rhythm, uh, it, it actually refers to our clock, our internal clock. And it does. What The clock that wakes you up, there's a burst of cortisol, which is one of these fat hormones that mobilizes sugar. The increased glucose floating around in your body wakes your brain up. And whether or not you, I mean, you're going to do a fast. When I reach for 40, you know, a ratio of 40, usually I have to get to 36 or 42 hours before I can get the number down to 40. So it's a, it's a pretty long fast, but I'll tell you, I've been doing it now for, I don't know, seven months and I'm not, I'm not perfect. Not every week did I get to do it, but it's my goal for 2019 that I do every week I hit a 40. And what you're really doing is you're bursting your growth hormone. You're bursting the hormones in your body that are important for youth and your skin and hair and you know, that telomere length, I don't know if you're into that, but it's the, yeah, yeah aging stuff yeah. that really, you, you got to make growth hormone to do that. And um, if you want a surge of that, it really, that autophagy is definitely pulsing the body when you fast that long, especially if you can mark that your ratio is what you're reaching for. You're not just saying, oh, the timer, if I make it to 40 hours, I quit. That's how I started out. But I've really adapted or adopted the... I fast until I hit a ratio of 40 or less. And once so I how hit that, often, how often are you testing yourself? You know, so I'll get up in the morning and test. And then I'll usually, I'll usually test at a, a, any kind of a hunger pain or any kind of like a, uh, I feel like I need salt. So there's mm -hmm. just something going on and you can, you can kind of feel it. So maybe by about noon or so, or maybe I kind of get distracted and I go till two o'clock. Um, but if I need salt, I check when I need salt um, because there's just something going on. I try to, <laughs> so I'm really, uh, uh, I'm a snacker at night. That's been my biggest enemy to conquer. So I will plan on things when I'm doing a long fast to be really nice to myself. And then I'll do a float during my fast. It's just a wonderful way to shut off your brain, to add that magnesium back to your body. And you're in water, so you're away from food. <laughs> That's what it does for me. So yeah. th those are things to think about to say, just be really nice to you when you do your first few fasts. It is a learned skill. And, you know, my, my family usually knows <laughs> if, that it's Sunday <laughs> night and I'm about to start a fast. Oh, and be nice to me. <laughs> Selma says, how often do you need it to be 40? You're just saying once a week. Isn't that what you just, re what you just yeah. covered? And so and the reason I'm doing that is I, if, if, if you had cancer, if you were my mom when we were doing Grandma Rose, we would be pushing this much more frequently than every week. 
I would be pulsing to get to a 40, um, you know, after and she would, she would, she would fast until a 40, then she'd have a good meal, then she'd fast until a 40. So it was like one meal every 72 hours. Yeah. In that zone. So Robert and Melissa Steptoe say, so based on what you're saying, when do you start eating? And when do you stop to get to 16 hours? So it's basically an eight hour window. So eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, Mm -hmm. really four. So you could eat between the hours of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's an eight hour eating window. So the 16, the rest of the hours, the evening and your sleeping hours are nothing but salt and water. That's what she means by the eight hour eating window and the 16 hour fasting. And you're really good about the, you know, not shoving food in at that last minute that you can possibly eat. Yeah. Uh, you know, we want you to have the food go in and then be out of your stomach by the time this eight hours is up. So yeah, the, the, I think the biggest worrisome for me on the 16 hour fast is that I wasn't eating enough because that has been my biggest problem when I couldn't lose weight is that I was one of those people that didn't eat enough. I would go all day with no food and eat enough to, you know, when you eat high fat, it can really fill you. And then when you eat just at night and then you go to bed, I was eating very little. Yeah. Right. And, and the sad part is, is that they, you were doing everything right. If you could have moved that meal to a different hour, yeah. which is essentially what we've done. Unfortunately, we've had, we've had a hiccup here of uh, hot flashes and, you know, the good news is, is you are being a testimony to so many women who, you know, the setbacks are what pe throw people off. Um, what I would tell you is that the, the amount of mental uh, strength that you get by continuing to nourish your body in ketones from now until the time you're in the grave, it, it will undo. I mean, look at how much your vitamin D has improved. Yeah. Uh, look at how well your brain is functioning. And then, of course, you've lost the 60 plus pounds. Uh, what has your weight been this week, by the way? Um, let me let me answer this question because there's a lot of people asking what salt. So the salt that I do is rock salt and it's pink Himalayan salt because there's like 83, 84 minerals. It's very good for you. If you're on the ketogenic diet, you need salt anyway. And it's just an excellent way to get minerals. It doesn't ever bloat me or anything. Um, there was one other question, hold on, before we get to weight. And I did have one other thing. Um, can keto and intermittent fasting replace hormone replacement for postmenopausal women? Do you think that's possible? Uh, say that again. So Luann Harris Lardy asked, can keto and intermittent fasting replace hormone replacement for postmenopausal women? Do you think that's possible? Well this is the part where if it, if their ovaries have been shut off for years, this is what my friend and I, the ob guy and I were talking about. She's like, that is, that's going to be a no, the ovaries have, they're done. But in your case, I mean, you have an ultrasound within the last six months saying, no, 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 they're still plump. They're still alive. Now they're yeah. going through something. Definitely. Uh, what yeah. we're hoping is to resurrect you out of the, uh, teetering edge of what will be menopause by really bathing those ovaries in excessive amounts of fatty, uh, fuel called ketones. So, and you really, and you do, you don't want to be in menopause before you have to, because you were explaining to me that your brain ages at a three to one ratio mm -hmm. and you, you start to age more. So mm -hmm. I definitely don't, want, I definitely don't want that. So mm -hmm. to get, um, I do want to talk a little bit. Well, first of all, I, even though I'm having all these crazy symptoms, I did have a weight loss of 1.2 pounds. Yay. That's so cool, I, Yeah, I, I didn't think it was anything, honestly, because it felt like it kept bouncing back around. But when I look at the numbers, I really did have a weight loss. And I do eat what I'm supposed to. I do You're eat what I'm off. supposed to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, that's what I told my husband. If this sweat meant that it was burning fat, then I would be so happy every time it happened. But it's not the case. <laughs> Um, the, other, the other thing I was going to talk about is that, you know, it, it is known that royal or a maca root can help to um, can help with hot flashes or be a natural supplement for it. And then the black cohosh can also mm -hmm. help. And I know that I really wanted to do this. Um, really dive in deep with these ketones and really see if that's the only thing that can do it. But every time I have a hot flash, which um, is probably 30 times a day, like not even kidding, 
Mm -hmm. I look at these supplements thinking I want to take some freaking supplements. Like if this could help, then do this. And I'm, I'm just don't know whether I should take the supplements or just dive into the ketones or do them both. Like so what the heck should I do? Here's the part that if it was me, um, mm -hmm. you have those supplements. And if we can't get your ovaries to resurrect, if we can't stimulate them to make this estrogen again, um, then they're always going to be there. We have a short window where you're right on the edge of whether or not your body is going to continue down this pathway, or if this was kind of a sputtering, uh, F and, and we hope that those FSH, uh, that you know your, your pituitary goes back to not screaming at your ovaries because your ovaries wake up and produce some estrogen. That if I was going to supplement anything, I would, I would really try to do the fast because you have plenty of ketones stored in all your fat cells. What we're trying to do is make those ketones float around your blood more. The way we do that is we pulse you. We give you that extended 36 hours with no, just salt and water. If you have caffeine addiction, I let people do that. But um, salt and water is the best. Salt water black coffee is what I do. Um, I don't put cream in my coffee when I'm doing the fast. If I was in your case and I was saying, oh, I can't handle this. I would, I would be supplementing with extra ketones every day, like exogenous ketones. Because again, what you're trying to do is keep the fuel as, as abundant as possible for that fat-based fuel to see if we can do that. The cohosh so, and the black, they're going to be there. You'll have those as options if this fails. But I would say give a solid three weeks of, let's see if we can do this. Let's see how your, your hot flashes do. So let's talk about exogenous ketones for a minute. If you were to suggest that I do the exogenous, how, how does that look? Is it once in the morning? Is that twice a day? Is that once an hour? Is that every 20 minutes when my hot flashes are happening? Like, what does that look like? <laughs> well, so again, if you look at uh, key, uh, exogenous ketones, they're salts. So they can cause, if you put a down, if you down a bunch of them at once, you really can have diarrhea. I mean, people have not, they've just down, they've really gone overboard. They're like, yeah, you're not going to do that twice. Um, but in someone like you, you're keto adapted, you, you have tasted them before, you know how they feel. The length of fuel hour is four hours for when you start it. That's how long okay. it fuels your system. Okay. So I would look at that at, you know, dose it at the beginning, right with your coffee. I would have the ketones in your fuel, in your eight hours of fueling time. So be sure to keep it in those eight hours. Um, when you say I, fueling time, does that mean when I'm eating? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 So I would put that in the morning and then four hours later, give another good dose of it. I really like, you know, the shot glass, half a scoop cream and ice. And it's just, I sip on that. It's kind of like a creamy, icy drink that is got, got that tart taste to it because it's salted. I mean, it's, there's salts. Yeah. Um, and there are sugar substitutes in nearly every one of these because they, these exogenous ketones taste terrible if you don't put sugar with them. Yeah. Um, so the point I'm making is uh, put the fuel in right after you have your coffee, put that in first thing in the day, um, put it in at four hours again. And again, what you'll feel is when the ketones are higher, you're going to feel uh, less appetite. It's an appetite suppressant. Just having, that's why when people say, how is it that you can be 48 hours in and you're not hungry? And I'm like, ketones, they're an appetite suppressant. And when my <laughs> body makes them myself, I got them out of an old fat cell that's been holding on to some lipids for the 20, best 20 years, you know, so it's win-win. Yeah. So the, the other thing is I've heard, and I don't know if there's, if this is just rumor or people talking about it, but if you take exogenous ketones, does that stop your body from making them like it does yeah. a testosterone shot? Mm. No, no. So you still have uh, fuel demands. Um, what I've, what I look at is, uh, you reach a higher level of ketones when we supplement them. Um, for my newbies, when they're first using ex exogenous ketones, I think of it as your liver is so pathetic at making these and you have so much insulin. I'm trying to biohack you to get the appetite suppressant available, give you good energy, uh, get your body used to seeing a ketone. That would be what a newbie's body chemistry is. And someone like you, I'm trying to raise the floor of those ketones. I want a higher ketone production. And when I supplement, now when the supplements are used up, you're going to have a, a stronger draw to meet the needs of that same ketone level 
from uh, during times when you're not supplementing in, in your you're in your fasting window. Make sense? It makes sense. Yes. You know, we have gone over our oh, one hour. Really? Yeah, we're seven minutes over. But this is such an interesting topic. And we've had a lot of viewers on obviously more than what we've I think what we've ever had. So that's great. If you've got if you guys have found this helpful, um, if you know anybody struggling with hormone issues, hot flashes, um, they're just starting the keto, they want to understand the science behind it, you might want to share them or share this video or tag, um, tag a friend who um, might find it useful. Um, the other thing is, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up. But if you have more questions about hormones and thyroid and all this stuff, I think this is a conversation that both um, Dr. Boz and I would be willing to um, talk about just because it is so helpful to so many people. So if you want to um, message me or leave, uh, leave a comment here asking whatever question you have, we will certainly try and fit it in to our next talk because we do these talks every Sunday night at 7 p.m. on the Keto Friendly Recipes Facebook page. And we're here to help. I obviously right. I don't even like to do lives, but I love helping people. <laughs> Good job. You got to make sure you give Jennifer such encouragement. And I just want really to say thank you that when I first asked, I had no idea it would become such a popular and such an informative process. But I am so thankful both of us said, let's just do it. Let's just let's push it. record. Yeah, we're you know, pushing I'm record just to teach you guys. So. I have one shameless plug. There is a, a metabolic conference that I want to just tell your viewers and you is my favorite conference of uh, the whole year. And it's where the scientists teach the, uh, teach the world. Um, it's happening at the end of the month. And if, uh, if you are looking for a conference, boy, I really encourage you to look into Metabolic Health Summit. That's what it's called. And I've encouraged Jennifer to come. We're not sure if we got her coming yet, but it is the best conference that's out there in keto. And it really has the credit for saying, how did somebody like me, primary care physician, ever learn about what's going on in the front lines? And it's thanks to this conference that um, it really feeds the scientists out there that want to know about what does a ketogenic diet have to offer? And I'm a, I, I don't get any, any commissions or anything. I'm just a really big supporter of what happens at this Metabolic Health Summit. So uh, if you want, uh, you can check out um, um, the website and then... Um, it's called where... Metabolic Health Summit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll come up right when you Google it. Yeah. Um, I'll send you a code, Jennifer, if they want 15% off. If it does, I have a code that will get them some money off. Not okay. commissions for me, just something that if they go sign up, I really want the, I want this to be a success for them. And it is really the, you know, if you think I'm nerdy about all this stuff, you should meet these people. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm certainly going to try and fit it into my schedule. I think I have one commitment that might overlap that. So if I go, it might be for a day or two, but I'm not sure yet, but we I would love are. to go. We could do our lives live together. <laughs> we could. <laughs> uh, awesome. All well, right. Thanks again for being on. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and hearing about the hormone talk. Let us know if you have any questions so we can add it for our next one. Have a good evening. Good night. Please subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Stay tuned.